Hello, I'm Melissa Fitzgerald, and I'm honored to speak with you today because there is nothing more exhilarating to me than empowering and engaging young people. Thank you to the Tennessee Healthy Transitions, Improving Life Trajectories, and Connect Two initiatives for inviting me to participate in this speaker series on relationships. I love this topic, especially now when all of our relationships have undergone such dramatic transformation. Over the last 13 months, we've been deprived of much of the human interaction that often typifies our closest relationships. But I found that in the midst of this adversity, many of my relationships have been strengthened. We've adapted and amidst the isolation and collective trauma, been drawn closer to the relationship that inspire us and support us the most. Relationships are living things. They evolve, sometimes hibernate, and often regrow into something stronger and more fruitful. And I believe interpersonal relationships hold the key to solving many of the most pressing issues of the day. I imagine it's not lost on you the magnitude of the global challenges you will face. As our politics continue to be more and more fractured and our once universally embraced national ideals grow more partisan and divisive, the country you are inheriting is in profound need of healing. The near constant barrage of negativity can feel overwhelming, but I believe laying just below the surface is something else. Hope. Hope in one another that we will rise to confront our challenges. Hope in our institutions that the wisdom with which they were built will withstand and endure. And hope in the universal goodness of people and the relationships that break down the ideological barriers. Hope does not just spring eternal. It draws strength in the face of adversity. I often get asked how I went from working as an actress on TV and film sets in Hollywood to working in office in Alexandria, Virginia and traveling to courtrooms around the country. But what I think is the most important question and the one that rarely gets asked is why? In 2006, I filmed my final scene for the television series, The West Wing. For seven seasons, I had the good fortune to be on a show that celebrated the enduring value of public service. I got to act with an incredible cast that embodied the ideals the show portrayed. It was an exhilarating time, and I knew on that last day of shooting that my life was about to undergo a major transition. Not knowing what comes next is daunting, as I'm sure many of you can relate. One thing I did know that whatever it was would involve service. The truth is I've always been drawn to service. The Reverend Martin Luther King once said something that's been a driving force in my life. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. When I was in fourth grade, we had a dog that I adored. And when a women's SPCA mailer arrived showing sad photos of dogs and cats waiting to be adopted, it broke my heart. I decided that I wanted to raise money to help them. Our school fair was coming up, so I thought it would be a great idea to sell balloons at the fair. So my friends and I bought some balloons and string. We didn't really think it through and didn't think about the helium. <laughs> we just sat at our fair and blew up the balloons ourselves, tied a string to them, and walked around and tried to sell them. Looking back on it now, it seems ridiculous. Here were three little girls selling the droopiest, saddest looking balloons. We were excited, and when we told people what we were gonna do with the money we raised, People bought them. We raised $50, which for fourth graders way back in the 70s seemed like a ton of money. There's still a goofy photo in my parents' basement of us presenting an oversized check to the women's SPCA. No one told us it was a dumb idea or how we should have done it better. They just encouraged us. And we came away from that experience with the belief that if we saw something that we felt needed to get better, we could do something about it. My family and school continued to support any and all service projects we decided to take on. Over the years, the idea of service as a necessary part of my life continued to grow. After college, I moved to New York City to study acting, and I went to a conservatory program at the Neighborhood Playhouse School of the Theater. On the first day, our acting teacher asked the class, what is the definition of acting? What is to act? 
seems like a simple question, but none of us were coming up with the most obvious answer. Finally, our teacher said, okay, what is to act? To act is to do. It was a great lesson for acting and one that I've carried with me throughout my career. But it's been an even more useful lesson for life. To act is to do. It isn't to wait around for someone else to do something or wait until the situation is perfect. It's not to sit on the couch and wait for the inspiration to come. This one lesson has probably shaped my life more than any other. While I continued to work as an actor, it was service that sustained me. I got together with several other actors and together we co-founded a nonprofit organization called Voices in Harmony. Voices in Harmony was a mentoring program that used theater to work with at-risk teens in Los Angeles. During this time, I was cast on the television series, The West Wing, but I continued to do our volunteer work for Voices in Harmony. Working on the West Wing reminded me of the transformative power of people working together, united in a mission, with respect for one another. While we were filming the West Wing, I got divorced and I went through a dark time. When I was at my lowest point, my family and friends rallied around me and someone very wise suggested to me that every night I write down three things for which I'm grateful and no repeating. Now, the first few days were easy, but after about a week and a half, I was digging deep, like a pencil to write the list, a piece of paper to write it down. Then it struck me that there are many, many people in the world who don't have these things. And it was time for me to go to one of these places and see how I could be of service. So when the West Wing ended, I did what any rational person would do. I packed my bags and flew to war-torn Northern Uganda as a volunteer with the International Medical Corps. I landed in Northern Uganda to co-lead a version of the Voices in Harmony theater program we had been doing in Los Angeles with several members of the Voices in Harmony team. We worked directly with former abducted child soldiers and other teens displaced by the brutal rebel war that had ravaged their country for years. These were children who experienced more loss than I have ever known, who had suffered unspeakable unspeakable tragedies and had been forced to commit horrific atrocities. But they refused to let these things define them. They persevered. When we began recruiting for the program, they showed up enthusiastically, committed to fight for a better lives for themselves, for their families, and for their community. When we were getting ready to go to Uganda, we had plenty of people tell us what a stupid idea it was. They need food and money, not a theater program. Deep down, I knew what we were doing was going to be a value for the teens, but I'm not gonna lie, I was filled with doubt and terrified that they were right. But I believed, and we all did, what the teens would gain from the program would not be temporary. Giving them the tools and skills to share their voices with their community, educate their community on the things that they felt their community needed to learn, and having the experience of their community listening and recognizing that their voices mattered. The topics that they chose to tackle were peace building and reconciliation and HIV AIDS. They had the chance to work together as a team to create relationships that may not have existed otherwise. And it gave them the chance to experience themselves as something else, to be known as something else, as powerful and capable of making change, lessons they could take with them throughout their lives. We remained in touch with the Ugandan teens from the program and they have indeed emerged as leaders in their communities. In addition to the theater program in Uganda, we produced a documentary about the program called After Kony, Staging Hope and used the film to garner support to help bring an end to the war in Northern Uganda and support communities that had been devastated by the war. I am happy to say that within several months of returning, we helped secure over a million dollars in funding to help educate girls in Northern Uganda. Our work in Uganda changed and challenged me. The teens in Uganda lived in a country ravaged by war, experienced unspeakable trauma, 
and suffered more loss than I've ever known. And yet they were filled with a sense of hope, hope for themselves, hope for their country and hope for their future. I thought about some of the problems plaguing our country and the deficit of hope that seemed to be growing all around. While all of this was happening, a dear friend who had been struggling with a substance use disorder ended his life. Martin Sheen knew this and invited me to join him in Washington DC for the National Association of Drug Court Professionals Conference. National Association of Drug Court Professionals or NADCP champions treatment courts. For decades, Martin Sheen has been a champion for social justice. One of the programs dear to his heart is treatment court or drug court as they were primarily known when they began. I knew a little bit about treatment courts from my father who worked in the justice system most of my life. First as an assistant district attorney and then as a judge, including serving as a justice on the state Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. My father was one of the people involved in launching the very first mental health court in Philadelphia. So when Martin reached out to me and asked if I would come with him to Washington DC and attend a treatment court conference, I of course said yes. That trip with Martin was my first real introduction to an issue that would alter the trajectory of my life. In Washington, D.C., I met people from all over the country who were dedicating their professional lives to improving the justice system's response to people with substance use and mental health disorders. They would not accept a system that discarded people and instead were pioneering a new approach that replaced punishment with compassion, judgment with a steadfast belief in the capacity for people to change if they are just given the chance. That week, I spent time with Martin and the team at the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, the nonprofit leading the treatment court movement. We met with members of Congress and advocated for funding for these life-saving programs. I headed back to Los Angeles inspired by the work being done and the lives being saved. About two years later, I was on the phone with the then head of NADCP when he mentioned they were looking for someone to head up their newest division, Justice for Vets, championing, championing one of the recent, at the time, modalities of treatment courts, veterans treatment courts. Before I knew it, I had thrown my hat in the ring. A few weeks later, I was traveling east to work in an office for the first time in my life. You'd be hard pressed to find an American family that's not been touched by addiction. In 2019 alone, we lost 70,630 lives to drug overdoses in the United States. And approximately 70% of those deaths involved opioids. The opioid epidemic has ravaged communities from coast to coast. We are in the middle of an addiction epidemic in our country. And the truth is the United States has been grappling with an addiction epidemic for decades. This combined with the war on drugs was sought incarceration and enforcement as a remedy, left the justice system overwhelmed with people who desperately needed treatment. In 1989, a group of justice professionals had had enough. They set out to create a new approach they invited treatment providers and counselors into the courtroom, agreed to work as a team on behalf of people and offered treatment, supervision and support instead of traditional sentencing. Anyone who completed the program would have their charges dismissed. What struck me the first time I sat in on a treatment court was the transformation of the traditional court setting. For men and women in the program, the courtroom was no longer a place of desperation and punishment. Treatment courts transform the courtroom to places of hope and healing. In these courts, justice is not determined by the length of a sentence, but by the lives transformed. Take, for example, the story of Abby. Abby grew up in rural Maine and began experimenting with drugs at a young age. 
By 17 years old, she was selling to support her use, which by now had become a substance use disorder. She had a baby, but was lost, lacking the resources and support to address the disease that was destroying her life. Shortly after her baby was born, she was arrested for trafficking. For many in Abby's situation, this would have marked the beginning of a painful, destructive cycle of incarceration. Approximately 80% of people in the justice system with a substance use disorder will be back before the judge. But Abby was offered drug treatment court. There, she found a community of people committed to her survival. She was placed in treatment, met with counselors, received recovery support. Slowly, she began to reconnect with the world outside her addiction. Eventually, Abby completed the program, then pursued a state license as a substance use and addiction counselor. She met her husband and she expanded her family. A few years later, she became a treatment provider for the same court that saved her life. Her former judge was now her colleague. A few years after that, she applied for and received a full pardon from the governor. And just last year, Abby, became a board member of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Her story is remarkable, but it is not unique. This is the type of transformation we see every day in treatment courts. Today, treatment courts are changing the way the justice system responds to addiction and mental health disorders. By harnessing community-based treatment and wraparound services, treatment courts not only reduce recidivism and save money, they improve housing, employment, family reunification, and community engagement. Most importantly, they prove that the foundation of our justice system should be rooted in public health and that compassion, not punishment, is the most effective way to ensure long-term success. Of course, I didn't know much of this when I took the job. When I attended the NADCP conference, I was co-executive producing a documentary called Halfway Home that profiled several veterans who struggled with their transition home from war. My job at NADCP was to be Senior Director of Justice for Vets, the division charged with expanding veterans treatment courts, a relatively new modality for veterans, as I'd mentioned, who have come into contact with the justice system due to substance use and mental health disorders. One of the first people I met in my new role was a veteran from Pennsylvania named Tim. Tim served his country in the United States Marine Corps. He was among the first soldiers to enter Iraq in 2005. Like too many other veterans, after returning home, Tim struggled to re-engage with the life he had left behind. He was angry, but he didn't know why. He was self-medicating with drugs and alcohol to cope. Soon, Tim was facing several felony charges and looking at prison time. But Tim's community had a veterans treatment court and instead of sitting in a jail cell, he was given the opportunity to change his life. Surrounded by other veterans, Tim accepted the help he needed. Through treatment, he came to understand the PTSD that was leading his self-destructive behavior. With constant support from the team, he regained the honor he had while serving. The program was tough, but fair. And no matter how many stumbles there were along the way, Tim knew that the team was going to support him because their goal was his health and well being. Tim graduated from the Veterans Treatment Court program, and today he, like Abby, works as the mentor coordinator for the same court that saved him. He's a husband, a father, and a proud veteran. Tim recently told me, I look at my young daughters and I am just grateful that I'm able to be present for them. Veterans Treatment Court didn't just change my life, it saved it. And I think it saved the future of my family. Our nation is better off with Tim as a leader in his community. And if we're help comfortable helping veterans like Tim, shouldn't we also help mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters who are struggling? 
Leading justice for vets was one of the greatest honors of my life. Two years ago, I transitioned to lead broader justice reform as director of NADCP's Advancing Justice Initiative. Our goal is to promote solutions that continue the transformation of our justice system that treatment courts have started. A few years ago, when my dad was being honored for his career in criminal justice, during his speech, he said something that stayed with me. In his speech, he asked, how are we, as a nation, going to take care of the most vulnerable among us? Will we make room for them in our hearts or will we make room for them in our prisons? This is the question at the center of justice reform. But it's a question we all must consider when thinking about the challenges of our time. Addiction is often referred to as the loss of connection. Recovery is the rebuilding of those connections. Recovery does not happen alone in isolation. I see parallels between the brave women and men striving for recovery in treatment courts and the national recovery we all must play a role in empowering. We live in difficult and uncertain times. I suppose times have always been difficult and uncertain, just in different ways. The only path ahead is one of collaboration, mutual respect, and support, and relationships that challenge us to be our best. Your generation has much wisdom to impart and we have so much still to learn. You will make changes that will impact generations to come. You are now the vanguards of hope. Someday soon, there will be a treatment court within reach of every person in need. Service to others will be a cherished and practiced national value. I believe that we can and will rise to confront the challenges of our time but we must lift each other up and do it together. Thank you.